Welcome to White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod. Delivered in short doses, this mini podcast features informal, on topic discussions with in house experts, outside counsel, and other thought leaders on a wide array of cutting edge and practical white collar and compliance topics. Visit PerkinsCoie.com for more information on our nationally ranked white collar and investigations practice. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Perkins Coie LLP and should not be considered legal advice. This is Gina LaMonica, a partner in the Perkins Coie White Collar and Investigations Group. I'm joined by my colleague, Karen Trombino, who is also a white collar partner, and our guest today, Dr. Brenda Ingram, who is the Director of Sexual and Relationship Violence Prevention and Services at the University of Southern California's Student Health Center. Dr. Ingram joins us to discuss our topic today, which is about conducting trauma-informed investigations in the context of gender and power-based harms, such as harassment, sexual assault, or abuse in the workplace and other settings. She is a consultant and frequent lecturer on the topic of trauma-informed investigations and trauma-informed care for human service agencies, including law enforcement, as well as physical and mental health professionals. Welcome, Dr. Ingram. We're so pleased to have you here to discuss this important topic today. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so to get things started, I thought it would be helpful to briefly provide some background on what we mean by trauma-informed investigations and how trauma-informed techniques can be used in internal investigations. So, Karen, you've used trauma-informed techniques in a number of internal investigations in your practice, but can you talk a little bit about how the concept of trauma-informed investigations first came on your radar? Sure. So, the first time I was actually trained and introduced to these concepts was in connection with some work I was doing with an anti-human trafficking, anti-sex trafficking initiative where we we were encouraged to utilize these techniques when interacting with the pro bono clients that we were representing those matters. Shortly after that, I received some additional training on these topics in connection with a confidentiality clinic that the ABA offered, primarily to assist survivors of domestic violence in quashing subpoenas that might be compelling information that would put them in jeopardy. And then outside of the pro bono context, I started hearing clients uh, requests and inquiries about us incorporating this techniques into you know non pro bono but uh, institution based investigations you know starting primarily in the higher education context I think maybe reflecting the fact that higher in- educational institutions had been you know familiarized with these concepts as part of the Title IX guidance and expectations from the Department of Education and wanting us to incorporate them into Uh, you know, what we consider internal investigations. And now I'm hearing requests and inquiries from clients outside of the higher education context, wondering if we can use these, if they can use these techniques, if we can use these techniques when doing a full range of investigations, not just sexual assault or sexual harassment or, you know, things that the types of investigations where I think these concepts originated and wanting to know if they could be utilized in investigations that might be looking at, uh, you know, other forms of trauma, you know, whether it's racial, racial hostility in the workplace, or maybe even toxic workplace environment type of type of issues. I totally agree. And I think you hit on an important point that we'll be discussing today. Trauma informed investigation techniques are gaining a foothold in the context of white collar investigations in a variety of settings, including in corporate investigations. And also the types of trainings that we're seeing being offered to human resources personnel and legal departments so that they're prepared to deploy these techniques. And Dr. Ingram, can you help us put a finer point on the meaning of trauma-informed investigation techniques? When we say that, what, you know, what kinds of things are we talking about? The, the term trauma-informed first. And so basically what that term comes from is more of the social sciences, behavioral sciences. In terms of people who have experienced a traumatic event, what we find in the field is that folks who have had trauma in their lives tend to respond differently, tend to remember things differently, and so 
the technique started again in terms of providing mental health services. Um, it's also now in uh, healthcare streams, and so it's sort of migrated into investigations because, as you are well aware, that people who are victims of crime are trauma survivors. The other thing to keep in mind is that trauma is so pervasive in our society. Uh, there are studies that show that anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of service recipients are survivors. And even if they're not receiving any kind of public services, there was a study done, uh, a huge study done on adverse childhood experiences in the late 90s that was also joined by CDC that said that about 70 percent of American adults have had at least one traumatic experience. And so, and, and 50% have had uh, more than that, have had anywhere from one to three or more experiences that uh, would constitute trauma. And so with that in mind, anytime you're trying to interview someone or you're talking to someone, it's important to keep in mind that there are things that could trigger them, uh, reactivate their trauma memories, if you will. And so trauma-informed approaches, trauma-informed care are terms that are used to denote the pervasiveness of trauma in the population and the need to take specific uh, strategies and approaches when gathering data from those folks or interviewing them or even providing services. Okay. And in terms of the use of trauma-informed investigative techniques, you know, from our perspective, I think we've seen it evolve over time, but I'd be really interested in what you've observed, um, given your background and your profession, how these investigation techniques have evolved over time in terms of law enforcement efforts. And then I think Karen mentioned this earlier, but then Later, Title IX guidance requiring, you know, trauma-informed training and techniques being used in those types of investigations. Okay, well, um, in terms of in, uh, law enforcement investigations, there's always been this need to ask people who are in highly crisis emotional state to give information. And so depending on how you ask those questions can determine how much information you're going to get. And so if you're looking even just from forensic interviewing, there are certain techniques that are very similar to when we talk about trauma-informed care and that we center the support on that person. You'll hear the term victim-centered. All of these sort of terms just basically say that we pay attention to what the victim or the trauma survivor is going through and incorporate those techniques into the work that we do. And so the International Association of Chiefs of Police has for probably, I want to say almost a decade, endorsed the use of trauma-informed as a best practice in investigations. And initially it started with sexual assault. It also really came into forefront we're looking at forensic interviewing of children who are child victims of sexual abuse. And so that just sort of, again, migrated into looking at uh, trauma-informed care when we're looking uh, working with adults. So again, if you go back and look at the information and the research around forensic interviewing of child victims, which has been around for at least since the 80s, you'll see these sort of techniques. And so it's been utilized with children for that. And then now moving into the uh, arena of working with adult victims, because we are seeing very similar issues around their ability to remember how they get reactivated in terms of trauma. And so, again, we want to do no harm. And so we need to adopt approaches that center on what the experience is of the person and try and protect them from further traumatization. So that's partly how it's come into be. And so it started out in sexual assault and then domestic violence investigations, and now it's being recognized uh, everywhere. As a matter of fact, the Department of Justice back in probably 2009-ish, somewhere around there, has, in, has basically endorsed and has uh, requested that everyone who is in any type of human services, and that includes law enforcement, adopt a trauma-informed perspective, especially in, in, in the criminal justice system. So we're seeing it in terms of judges are now being trained, uh, child protective service workers are being trained. So anyone where we know the, the service population is dominated by trauma survivors um, is being um, 
asked to utilize a trauma-informed perspective. And I, I think you said something really interesting there that I want to kind of draw out a little bit, which is the trauma-informed approach recognizes the neurobiological response, impact on memory that trauma events can have, but also is geared towards avoiding re-traumatization when you have to go and investigate these, you know, traumatizing events that may have happened. And are there different, I mean, from there, does the approach, the trauma-informed approach differ on dealing with memories and recounting versus avoiding re-traumatization? Well, I I, I wouldn't say versus. Uh, It's part of all the same process. So as you are asking questions of people that are going to go into the dark, dark places, you want to try and care for those people. So I think it's a recognition that we want to be compassionate to survivors and not just come and ask them questions that are going to trigger memories in a way that will re-traumatize them. But how do we get the information and reduce uh, re-traumatization? Obviously, it's not going to go down to some zero, but if you can uh, be as purposeful in your process, you can help to reduce that. And so it includes things of just sort of educating the person, taking your time, being more patient. So these are, you know, if you take the trauma-informed care term, are just good practices for interviewing. We always talk about rapport building. When you have built rapport, and we've always talked about that in terms of of, of uh, investigations or interviewing people, that you need to have some type of a safe relationship. And so the only thing that trauma-informed care has done is sort of package this a little differently and then said, here are all the different sort of interventions. Here's the philosophy. This is why we do it this way. And again, there's always police departments have always used sort of cognitive interviewing techniques where they use strategies to sort of get to the information in the least harmful way to the participant. So again, it's just being packaged in terms of trauma-informed care and collecting all of those good practices from forensic interviewing of children to the psychobiology. I mean, all of those issues are coming into play now and being packaged under trauma-informed care. Gina, you and I know that we've ourselves utilized these techniques in some pretty significant investigations. And for the most part, I, I've only heard good, good positive feedback, but, but I was recently having a conversation with someone who had kind of raised this question about critiques of the techniques, and it, it essentially comes down to some questions about, it really, I think, it comes down to a question about the science, and is there sufficient scientific or adequate convincing scientific basis to conclude to you know to draw these conclusions about you know faulty memory or you know what what we might view as faulty memory because as we all know when fact finders are assessing credibility you know i think historically people have this this notion that you know if somebody's telling the truth they'll they won't have a spotty memory uh, their story won't change. And as Dr. Ingram just kind of explained, <laughs> there's, you know, I think a significant now amount of scientific basis to show that, in fact, victims of trauma, it does manifest itself in, in these ways in terms of their not necessarily thinking in a chronological fashion, not re- necessarily remembering every detail of a traumatizing incident. And so unfortunately, I think that the critique basically makes it come down to a battle of the experts, so to speak. And I, you know, I think probably Dr. Ingram knows a little bit more about uh, some of the critique uh, that has come out with respect to these, these methods and these conclusions and could probably speak to it better than better than I can. Well, I, I, I would say that one of the major critiques that sort of brought all these issues together was the article in The Atlantic, where they really sort of talked and tried to debunk some of the science. But there is 20, 30 years of science that support uh, these approaches. I mean, even if we just get just very sort of just sort of common and look at what happens when you do a whole lot of studying for this high stakes test and you know you know that information and then as soon as you sit down in front of that page to take the test you don't remember anything or your your memory is shoddy and again it has to do with anxiety and so we know that anxiety can play a role in what you remember again just 
just looking at it from a lay perspective, we, we have all experienced this, that when you are highly stressed, it is hard to remember things. And so if we just look at our own personal experiences with this type of phenomena, we can see that, there, that it is true. Again, when we talk about trauma-informed approaches to interviewing, it is just one one technique, one strategy at getting to credibility. It is not the sole one. And I don't think trauma-informed care or trauma-informed interviews would ever say that this is the, the Bible of how you do it. It is just one way of measuring credibility. And it just basically says, take these factors into account that if the person's story changes, it might not be intentional deception. It could be that they are, it's related to their anxiety and how the brain functions. So what we do know and what we have, and I've done some training with law enforcement, is to say that immediately after a traumatic event, people are going to have trouble remembering. It usually takes a couple of weeks for the brain to sort of calm down. And so you may not get as a colorful details or graphic details in the very beginning. And again, it varies so much again, uh, depending on who the person is, depending on their subjective experiences, depending on their history, depending on their gender, depending on their age. So all of these personal factors determine how this person is going to respond and what they're going to remember. So it is not this sort of one-size-fits-all in trauma-informed care. It basically says is that you take these factors into account when you are interviewing someone and that you want to build rapport. So how do you build rapport? And so the more rapport you have, the more the person is able to calm down. They calm their amygdala down, which is our alarm and threat system. And we know from the neuroscience that when the amygdala is activated, it can truncate or short circuit the prefrontal cortex, which allows us to have more rational thought. It impacts the hippocampus, which is where long-term memory is stored. So these are things that are documented in the neuroscience of the brain. So there's no, there's just tons of science to support this, and more and more science is coming out. So, but again, it is not the end all. It is just one approach to help people to understand credibility and not to just rule out folks because maybe they don't remember things exactly in the order, that they may leave out certain details, certain things stand out to folks more. One of the things that we talk about in terms of just cognitive interviewing, which has been around for 40 or 50 years, is that you know you utilize people's uh, senses that help them to remember things because uh, when you are in a highly agitated crisis, emotionally crisis, crisis state, your brainstem, if you will, the more primitive parts of your brain sort of take over to help you to survive. And so certain things are going to stand out more. You're not going to remember how to do a math problem, but you remember what something smells like. So what we ask people is to, you know, what smells do you remember occurring during this event? What sounds do you remember? So we try and pull in a lot of sensory data because the sensory data is what's captured in the amygdala and that's where you can help trigger longer term types of memories that live in the hippocampus. So it's, again, tons of science to back this up. Part of what we saw was sort of this pushback from respondents, uh, especially around Title IX, and again, the I don't want to say the anti-science movement, because that's probably too broad, but just people questioning this new approach. But again, it's important to understand that it's been around for decades. It's just being packaged under trauma-informed care. Yeah, and I mean, some of what I was reading, and I, this was only because I was prompted to <laughs> to have this conversation with someone about you know, the, the critiques about trauma-informed. And some of what I was reading was just gross mischaracterizations of what trauma-informed is, and including, like, it means that you never, you always believe the victim, and you never, you know, you never believe the respond. You know, it was just, like, pretty transparently. <laughs> um, Very reactive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I am curious to know, you know... I guess what concerns me at some level is I do think some of these concepts, some of these conventional wisdom type of concepts about how, you know, how a true victim would respond and, you know, what a true victim's memory might, you know, might how it might kind of manifest. I feel like there's this, probably driven by popular culture, but 
so many people have these preconceived notions about how a tra- how really a victim should respond, and how I you know it's, I understand fully that there's a, a significant scientific basis for for these you know for the conclusions on trauma informed you know responses, but how how do we combat that at the level of scale that we're talking about? I mean, you know, the resources are such that I can't imagine you, there are resources available to do kind of a battle of the experts, you know, with with sexual assault, even just even if you just narrow it down to sexual assault trials or hearings, you know, how much of it is going to depend on educating the adjudicators about these concepts, because I would assume not a, a lot of people aren't going to be able to put on an expert to explain these techniques and, and explain kind of the, some of the scientific conclusions. Everyone, I'm part of a group that does training for Title IX. I've trained uh, uh, law enforcement here in Los Angeles, LAPD. So there is a lot of folks out there training on trauma-informed care. It is still obviously sort of new with the term, but law enforcement has typically taught cognitive interviewing. So even before trauma-informed care showed up, they were doing these sort of techniques. Uh, And like I said, this is just sort of a packaging of it in a different way to sort of look at uh, in a more holistic approach how these uh, they're being impacted so again it's not you know rocket science though it is neuroscience and so these are concepts that are pretty easy for people to to grasp and put into practice when given the opportunity to to do that and so again it's it's not far-fetched to say you know what we we talk to victims in a compassionate manner we want to make them feel safe these are the tenets of trauma-informed care which again is is not that deep it has implications from the in a neuroscience sort of way that we can now document what goes on in the brain through MRIs and things like that that just support what we have already known to be best practices and so I think one of the one of the reasons why there is this sort of pushback on trauma-informed care because it, it, it has really blossomed in terms of sexual assault investigations and to me uh, honestly I think it has a lot to do with the politics around sexual assault and the issue of rape culture. Uh, Rape culture tells us that women are making these things up when they say, this happened to me. Women are out to get men, and so there, then that all comes from rape culture. And so I think one of the reasons that trauma-informed care has been looked at in this sort of a way is because of who the victims are. And this is a really a democratizing, if you will, of interviewing of, of the criminal justice system and saying that, you know, everyone is entitled to be heard. Victims are entitled to be heard. And so, again, when we're looking at female victims, there's always already this skepticism about their stories. And so here's just another nail in that coffin, if you will, around discrediting females and their experience of sexual violence or gender-based violence. I, I would be remiss if I didn't also add to that, simply because Gina and I have handled investigations involving adult male survivors, sexual, sexual assault survivors, the amount of <laughs> uh, the level of misconception and kind of mythology around how a male adult survivor should have responded to a sexual assault is also pretty astounding. And I, you know, I, it, it's I, <laughs> it's interesting, and I feel like at some level it it comes down to victim blaming, not not necessarily just female victims, but at some level, you know, in the American psyche. You know, it, it's scary for people, I think, to to imagine themselves that, oh, I could be a victim, too. So they, you know, they kind of come up with these ways of convincing themselves that, well, no, there could have been something that this person did to avoid this from happening. And that's, you know, unfortunately. Right. And and, it, and that's sort of, again, part of our, our, our culture. But I think why it's even harder for males is because this is so gender based and that these are crimes that happen to women. And so for it to happen to a male goes even 
deeper in terms of the culture. If we accept that it happens to males, then we have to accept that it happens to females. One of the reasons why we are moving even away from the term gender-based violence is because we want to recognize that this is issues of power. And then if we only focus on women, we're going to continue to be stuck in this place of, oh, this is just women and how they perceive things and what they're thinking. And uh, But really, this is about power. And so that's why it can be more, it's a more inclusive term. But we do go back and forth between gender-based and, and power-based because it's it's people can more readily understand when we're talking about gender-based violence. And again, it does not exclude men from being victimized in this regard but predominantly the the victim is female. And so that's why we talk about it in terms of gender. But for men to be victimized in a gendered-fied way can be even more devastating because, again, it smacks up against masculinity uh, narratives. It addresses patriarchal... I mean, it's just... It covers everything. And so I have found that men are even less believed than women. Men are are made to feel like they are less than men. Uh, Again, putting them in the camp with women. If you were a real man, this could not have happened to you. Uh, And so, you know, we go back to rape culture, which supports this, which supports the, the power structure, the patriarchal power structure. These are all things that say to women that you cannot have control. Your voice does not matter. I'm curious, Dr. Igram, it sounds like you've you've provided these types of trainings to law enforcement, to, to uh, universities. Have you been asked yet by kind of more corporate, you know, con- um, clients for these types of trainings as well? Is that something you're seeing on your side? Yes, I have. One of the a huge corporation had me come in and talk about uh, trauma-informed investigations for their HR in terms of workplace harassment and other types of issues that could lead to an investigation. And so again, it's it's the issue, anyone who uses investigation as a core skill set, I've been asked to come in and train their people in understanding trauma-informed care because again, by the time it gets to an investigation, some trauma has happened or else it would not be going that that direction in terms of investigation. So something usually has happened that has created harm or some harm has been done. And again, harm leads to trauma. So, yeah, so I'm getting uh, requests by corporations to come in and train their HR and uh, investigators around trauma-informed care so that they can get better outcomes in terms of their investigations and that they do not do more harm to those who have reported. And in terms of kind of training those folks, I mean, what do you view as kind of the best, like, and I you know, the best practice, you know, training suites. I know, I I think you commented before in a previous conversation with Gina and I that, you know, some people have a feeling or have the notion that one training is it and I'm good to go and now I'm going to go interact with traumatized people. What, you know, in your view, what is, you know, what is the best practice in terms of training of, let's say, a corporate constituency about about these techniques? Well, if I can take a step back from trauma-informed interviewing a second, I would talk about trauma-informed organizations. A lot of times what you'll find is that people say, well, come in and fix this problem. But it's really, we have to look at the, the culture in the organization. And so we ideally want organizations to become trauma-informed. Therefore, trauma-informed investigations become a natural component of that organization organization versus an add-on or something that just sort of sits on top of the culture but is integrated into the culture. For example, if you have us have me come in and I train your staff on trauma-informed investigations, but you still operate a trauma-inducing organization, meaning that you don't take care of your staff, you don't provide that supportive debrief for them, you don't do the things to take care of them, they are not going to be able to implement trauma informed approaches with the service recipients, the clientele, the patients, it's going to be harder for them to do that because it is just sort of this thing that sits on top and is not integrated into the culture. So, but again, it doesn't mean that there isn't some um, benefit from training people on trauma-informed care. Sometimes it's a top-up, I mean, a, a 
a bottom up sort of approach. Uh, usually that's how we come in is that they say, okay, fix all these workers here and make sure that they can do it. And then those workers start to change the culture on the ground and it pushes up. I always say that it's important for the board of directors, the board of trustees, managers, supervisors, again, folks that have to do it policies, practices, that they need to be, uh, they need to understand trauma-informed approaches or else they're going to enact policies. For example, you only have two vis- you only have two interviews. Well, no, no, let's put this way. You only get one interview, and that means you got to cram it all into a four-hour interview. Well, trauma-informed says that's not a really great great way to care for the interviewee or the interviewer. But the organization says because of how we are funded, this is how we have to do it. And so then the person who is doing the interview isn't able to implement trauma-informed care approaches in a way that makes sense. And so therefore that doesn't work as well. So what we want to do is help folks to understand how it needs to be part of the culture, part of the corporate culture um, that we support the people who are doing this work and not just be this little thing that we will fix them. They'll get it done, but we'll stay the way we are. It just makes that work so much harder. And then we also say that it is not a one and done, that you go in and have a trauma-informed training on investigations or whatever, that you need to renew that. You need to have annual trainings. You need to onboard people. Um, You need to look for people in the work workforce that you're going to hire who already have trauma-informed care notions or an affinity for it. And so there's a lot of moving parts in this when all you thought you wanted was someone to teach your staff about trauma-informed investigations. And so again, it, it, it ends up where I go back and talk about, okay, now how do we take care of our staff who are doing all these interviews? They themselves will absorb the trauma if they are talking a lot to traumatized folks. So now we talk about how do we create a culture in our corporation that supports the work and supports the worker. So, as you can see, there's a lot of layers to this beyond just trauma-informed investigation, that I cannot be compassionate if my employer is not compassionate with me. Um, And so we want to encourage this sort of environmental approach, this sort of culture shift, uh, culture transformation, if you're going to really do trauma-informed investigations, because you need to support the people who are doing it. And we layer that over the type of investigation that is done in the corporate context or in the educational context. There are various stages at which this technique can come into play. And I just thought it for, you know, practical advice purposes, it might be helpful to review a little bit of how a trauma informed technique can layer over what, you know, white collar practitioners might think of as a traditional internal investigation. And it can impact everything from, you know, the witness interviews that you conduct and how you document them to the final report and the way things are phrased in there to be accurate and to be balanced. So one, the first area right off the bat, uh, which is something Karen and I have um, encountered in the investigations that we conduct, um, particularly where there's you know a, a, a broad base of protect potential survivors or victims is whether or not to reach out to someone that you have reason to believe may be in the position to report an assault or a violation. And if you, you know, the the weighing of whether to reach out to them versus re-traumatizing them by doing that and taking that power away from them to be able to tell their story on their terms. And, and Dr. Ingram, I think Especially in the higher education uh, context, sometimes there are requirements to investigate. So how do you balance or how, what would be your uh, advice in, in approaching whether or not to be the one that reaches out um, to someone that may be a survivor to say, did something happen and, and will you talk to us about it? I'm going to take a couple of steps back because I think to focus solely on trauma-informed investigations sort of only gives you part of the picture. So how do you build a culture that is trauma-informed? And when you build this culture that is trauma-informed, reaching out to someone who's been harmed is a, becomes a different 
but also easier thing to do. And that's about how do we educate everybody. So let's say in a corporation, I want to educate folks. I want them to feel safe. I want to always let them know what are the options. I want to get to know them before I have to reach out to them only in terms of an investigation. Because if that's your first time reaching out and talking to someone, even if there's nothing wrong, you need to build a relationship before you reach out. So trauma-informed investigations is sort of like way down the road of the in, getting towards that end product. But what are we doing in front of that? How are we educating folks? How are we helping them to feel comfortable making a report before we reach out to them to make a report? And so that's why I'm saying that trauma-informed care is, again, this sort of continuum that, that permeates the culture. And if all you do is say, okay, we had something happen, let's now jump into our trauma-informed hat, you're going to be missing the mark. And you need to start sooner and, and build relationships with folks so that people know that if someone comes and says, hey, I heard something happen, can we talk about it? They already know that you are a safe person to have this conversation with, that you will take do care with their their story, their narrative, their experiences, and then that makes it easier to do that. But that being said, most places don't do that. Right. Um, they start. <laughs> but I'm just giving you best practice. Right. So most places start at the at the time that something happens, and honestly, that's going to make it more difficult if you wait until then. It doesn't make it impossible. And so what. What we do here at USC is that our Title IX folks send, when they learn of something, they send an email out to students saying, oh, we heard this happened, blah, blah, blah. Here are your resources. If you feel that you would like to make a report, then here's how you can make that report with us, and we are here. Here is a supportive services that are confidential, and if you just want to talk to them, you can talk to them. So they don't start that first thing was, you know, you're being called to be a witness in an investigation. It starts off by, they start off by offering care first. And so again, and those are just some things to take into account, that if I only reach out to you when something bad happens, then as soon as you see me coming, you're going to run. Because you said, oh, you know, that's the, that's the bad news messenger. So, again, what can you do to set the stage for care? And again, and we use care in a very broad sense. People t- typically think, oh, that's just what they do in mental health or health science. Uh, primary care, but all of us who are in the field of human services are helpers, and all of us engage in care at at different levels. So how are we caring for folks before we go to them with an investigation? Have we had conversations? Have we done supportive measures? That all helps. But then when you reach out, again, giving people that option. Yeah, I heard this happen, and we want to investigate it, and knowing that the narrative belongs to the survivor. It does not belong to anyone else. And so they decide whether or not they want to come forward, whether or not they want to talk to you. You may even offer them someone else that they can talk to before they talk to you. So what are you doing to prepare the stage for the interview? Um, How are you building rapport? Those are all important things. And as much control as you can give to that person, that's what um, you should do. Again, they can't have 100% control, but also know that one of the outcomes of trauma is that you look for control wherever you can get it. And so what that may come across to the person who's on the other side doing that investigation is that this person's being obstinate. They're being uncooperative. They're being resistant, is what we always call folks in mental health. And it's not that they're doing that, it's that they are trying to take care of themselves and we are not acknowledging the the fact that they should be able to take care of themselves. They should be able to set the stage for themselves because, again, part of what happened to them was someone took their power away. And we want to empower people. So at every step of the way, you want to empower them. So how is, how is this going for you? How does this day work for you? How does this time work for you? Not you will show up at Tuesday at 2 o'clock. That, again, is a disempowering approach. So how much do you give over some of your control? It's kind of like what I tell parents when I'm doing parenting uh, workshops is that you're always going to be the parent. You're always going to be the adult. 
But, you know, and you always want your kid to have vegetables, but does it have to be peas? Lay out a number of vegetables that the child can choose from. Give them some control over their environment and people will cooperate. And that's key to getting the information so that I can get what I need. I need to give up some of my power and and support you in getting your needs met. And uh, again, that's that's just how life works. We are just making it intentional and purposeful and bringing it to the conscious level because we do it anyway, but we just don't acknowledge it. I think what can be difficult for large institutions to accept, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about how the survivor reacts to this. The other piece of it is institutions, and I think this gets to your broader point, Dr. Ingram, about kind of is the institution kind of walking the walk on trauma-informed because oftentimes I think it's it's hard for the institution to accept, you know, handing over that that power, uh, that autonomy to the survivor because maybe they don't want to cooperate and that's not going to happen. And I think, at least in my experience, it can be hard for the institutional stakeholders to really embrace the fact that if we're saying it's survivor-centered, that means we're respecting that person's autonomy and there are limits that we can't push past. And I think before, again, what have we told folks Because the same thing is true in law enforcement. You know, the same thing is true for any investigation. At some point, depending on what evidence you already have, you move forward. But even as you move forward, you still want to look for places where I can give some power and control back to that to that victim. So again, it might be we're going to have this investigation, but you choose the day, you choose the time, you choose the location. You know, so what kind of things can we do that can give some of that power back to to that victim? Because again, we're taking a power over someone and that's going to shut people down and make them defensive. And you're not going to get the information you thought you want you you need to have anyway. So let's take a step back, give them time. Let's build that relationship. So maybe we don't start off with, okay, what happened? And again, this is why I say we go back to looking at policies and practices of the organization. Do we have to do it all in one shot? What's, where's our flexibility here? Because that's another, again, major tenet of trauma-informed approaches is flexibility. How much flexibility can you provide the person? A lot of times we can provide way more flexibility than in our heads we think we can. Because ultimately if the person says, no, I'm not going to cooperate, what are you going to do? So if you can give that flexibility, and again, that's a lot of times why we end up in lawsuits is because people were being coming from their position and not looking at the the greater good. And so the more that we can be flexible with folks, the greater the level of cooperation that we're going to get. But yeah, granted, at some point, you're going to have to push people forward. But even in that pushing forward in the investigation, where can I look for opportunities to empower them? I think we can talk about some big picture, you know, takeaways from this discussion. Karen or Dr. Ingram, unless you have something other, you know, that you wanted to address specifically on the steps of investigative techniques. There's so many pieces attached to the investigation. I think one thing is, I think one important piece to keep in mind is language. Words do matter. Language matters. And so you want to be very intentional about how you ask questions. And that's really one of the main pieces when we talk about trauma-informed investigations is how do we ask questions in a way that empowers as opposed to disempowering, that center the person in their own narrative and, and not try and impose our will around someone's narrative. I may control the process, but that person controls the content. And so however we can ask questions that allows that to happen, the better the outcomes of that interview that we're going to have. And so that's sort of trauma-informed investigations in a, in, a, in a nutshell, is how can I ask questions in a way that is supportive and still get the information that I need? Yeah, I, I, that just leads me to think of, you know, what are the techniques that we've employed in our investigations, which is really tr- trying to avoid labeling the the person. Um, and, and going back to what we talked about earlier, in particular, on some of our interactions with male adult survivors of sexual abuse, you know, not using, in talking with them, not using the word victim, not using the word survivor, not even necessarily using the word abused and trying to neutralize some of that language so we don't, we're not alienating them and that we're letting them tell their story in a way that doesn't 
yeah. box them in. And understanding male culture is where that comes from. So an, another major principle of trauma-informed approaches is cultural sensitivity and understanding male culture. You don't call men victims. That does not sit well in male culture. And one of the things that we've done with males, and actually one in six did this quite well, is a national organization that works with uh, the issues around male sexual abuse. They have talked about non-consensual sex as opposed to sexual assault. And for all intents and purposes, same, same, but different words. When I teach a class, I used to ask this question, how many people in this class prepare themselves to address issues around survival of sexual violence? 90% of the women's hands go up, no men's hands go up. And men's culture does not support men being victims of sexual violence. They may be a victim of robbery, and actually men have the highest rate of victimization uh, way more than women do. But for these particular types of violent acts, women dominate. And so no men's hand go up. This is not part of male culture to prepare oneself for victimization from uh, around sex. It's just not part of their culture. And so to call them a sexual assault victim is like, that's a foreign concept. So yeah, language matters and understanding the culture of the people that you are going to be interviewing plays a significant role in centering that investigation or interview around who that person is. And I'm, I'm just really struck as we close out our conversation about some of the similarities of that we see in, you know, your bread and butter corporate compliance internal investigations that Karen and I conduct on a regular basis. And it's the same types of principles that we preach to our clients in terms of a culture of compliance, tone at the top, you know, don't get to the point where you have the fire burning and it's the first time that you're speaking to an employee and those overlaps with conducting, you know, a victim-centered uh, investigation is is really astounding to me because you've talked today about, you know, Dr. Ingram making sure that you have a culture where people feel comfortable reporting things like this, speaking to someone in student health services or another outlet about what happened to them and that laying the groundwork for an, an, inf- an effective investigation. Exactly. That That's paramount. It doesn't, you know, if people feel that they're in a uh, harassing environment, an unsafe environment, trauma-informed investigations is not going to change their reluctance or support them. It may do a little bit better, but they're not going to want to talk because, you know, they've seen what's happened to other people. They haven't felt cared about by the organization. And so for a lot of people, investigations, you know, well, what do you want out of it? It's not about me. It's about you. You're doing this to cover your butt. And you'll hear that from a lot of people when, you're, when you want to go in and do an investigation. But again, if the stage has been set that this is a corporation that cares about its staff and employees, that we do whatever it takes to help you feel comfortable and safe, then you're going to get a way more cooperation in an investigation than if people are seeing you know, the bodies as they walk down the hallway, lining the hallway, so to speak. They are not going to feel safe and they're not going to cooperate in an investigation of any kind, even if it's to their benefit. And that's the other thing that we talk about is that in building rapport, you have to look at what are the cost and benefit factors for that interview. So if the person feels that, well, you're not going to do anything anyway, why should I waste my time and, and talk about all these horrible things that happened to me when it's going to end up being nothing or I will get in trouble or I will be ostracized or there will be negative consequences. So people are going to be weighing the cost benefit factors in terms of participating in any type of investigation. And so if they feel that this is to my betterment, it's going to help me, then I'm more willing to cooperate. But if I'm in a corporation where, you know, you open your mouth and the first thing that happens is that you get in trouble, uh, and I always tell people, you know, we're adults, we don't get in trouble. And that's really hard because so many people have gotten into trouble when they've said something that you come in and you try and do an investigation, it's just going to fall flat. Yep. Dr. Ingram, thank you. Really great insights. Appreciate your time today. And thank you for joining us uh, for this important discussion. This concludes this episode of White Collar Briefly. Please visit whitecollarbriefly.com where you can subscribe to our blog and find additional updates on current white collar and compliance topics. 
White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod. Copyright 2020 by Perkins Coie LLP. Thank you for listening.